I have served very happily on GSP's board uh, for the next few years, and I'm looking forward actually to getting more involved with GSP. I threw my janky.net website up there, uh, actually not for self-promotion, but just see if you're interested in examples of, of how I've been writing um, about science or you want to get in touch, you can do that um, through, through that spot. The first point I want to make about scientific storytelling, uh, I, I joke with people and it's, it's ceased becoming a joke, but um, when I was running a biophysics lab at the University of San Francisco, had some, some grant success. Uh, I told people the biggest factor in that was me taking undergraduate fiction workshops as a, as a wee physics major back in the day. But it really did uh, not help me write fictional grants, but it helped think about why is a reader moving, and we've heard about this this morning, from sentence one to sentence two, paragraph one to paragraph two, will they, will they flip a page um, of a grant proposal? So this idea, if you take a fiction class, is all about uh, dramatic, dramatic tension uh, resonating um, with Rebecca's talk um, already and Amy and Emily's as well. Why, why should the audience care? Um, establishing the stakes uh, of the story is something that, that tension does automatically. There, now, I would say there are two easy forms for any uh, research scientist to think about. Um, maybe an English major or a literature major would, would take you through this idea of a narrative arc and um, crisis, conflict, resolution, et cetera. But I think it could be a little simpler. Uh, we're often trying to solve a, a mystery in a scientific problem. That has a built-in narrative tension if you're just aware of it and, and use it to some effect, right? Uh, many of us grew up knowing that when um, Spock made a quizzical face, we needed to sit forward in our seats, that, that something was really um, worth following other than explosions or whatnot, right? Uh, another way a good writing professor pitched it to me is to, to think about a character. And I would submit to you to broaden your sense of what a character is. A character could be uh, a molecule, um, a regulation, uh, an agency, a company, <laughs> uh, broaden our sense of character, but there's a goal versus an obstacle, right? Odysseus wants to get home. Odysseus faces many, many obstacles. Um, now, if you'll indulge me, we've seen some good examples of, of how writing moves from a, a traditional scientific form to something more digestible. Um, today, I really liked uh, Amy and Emily's versions of this, and uh, Rebecca had these great um, morphs to press releases. Uh, let me start, I just made this up with apologies to people who work in the field. Um, I'm, I'm not a chemist, I am trying to come up to speed. So let's just say we have um, this, this preamble in a potential press release, or even I would argue, um, think about the first two sentences of your abstracts, the first two sentences of the introduction of your paper. The more readable those are um, the better faring I think you have in moving ahead in this sort of um, ecosystem that, that Miriam described last week so well. Uh, and I would also argue I've never heard back from an editor or a granting agency that there wasn't enough jargon in, in the first part of this paper uh, or this was too easy to read, right? Many of you have sat with stacks or sorry, piles of PDFs of grant proposals to go through. And when you find one that's, that's approachable in its early stages, it can be a delight. But to go through this, uh, this section, it is well known that health problems can result from exposure to flame retardants. Uh, first, red herring, from my sense, is something we do a lot scientifically. We're trying to establish uh, a common base with our scientific audience. It is well known. I would argue, though, that that puts a reader either saying, well, maybe not that much new is headed my way if I keep reading, or if someone doesn't agree that it's well known, you may put them in a defensive posture. Uh, then we have a lot of traditional science communication um, verb forms, including the so-called passive voice have been documented. And of course, we, we do use that a lot. It's fine. I think this is a grammatically correct paragraph, uh, but it's not what a writer would call in engaging 
uh, and then cognitively, it's not as engaging as a stronger verb could be. Um, so perhaps we could repitch this with a little sense of emphasizing the mystery. Uh, a problematic chemical has found a new way to infiltrate our lives and homes. So we have some more active verbs. Uh, as most of us accumulate a growing array of electronic devices, many contain increasing amounts of flame retardants. And then we go on to say, we own it, we share, uh, and we mention our, our target. If you are in one of these groups, manufacturer, consumer, policymaker, uh, stay tuned, you might wanna read on. Now, I do want to mention um, sentences, and I'm following the writer Francine Prose here, who, who said, a, uh, you have to picture for a long sentence, which we need in scientific communication, picture a tightrope and you're asking your reader to move past, to move down this tightrope. And it it's, can be challenging, uh, especially with technical content. And Rebecca, I mean, um, Francine Prose's point was to have ultimately great empathy for your reader. So uh, I would argue, especially in the age of social media, start with short sentences. We've studied abstracts in some of my science writing classes to see really successful abstracts often do start with 10 word, a couple of 10 word sentences up front. One thing we love as scientists is prepositional phrases because we're trying to be specific at standard temperature and pressure in this model organism, et cetera. Um, in a given sentence, do try to keep track and minimize those prepositional phrases if you're communicating with part of this larger um, ecosystem. I would say uh, we've heard about uh, caveats. We can equivocate ourselves um, off the news page if we're not careful. I think it works well to condense caveats into one one segment, it's very easy for us as scientists to sprinkle them into every sentence, if our assumptions hold, if this theory is correct, et cetera. Uh, active voice, I've mentioned, and this, this often means having a strong verb, avoiding being verbs like is and are, and, and letting a verb carry some weight. It really does engage the mind with our storytelling species in your audience. Uh, this is taken more from a student piece, a really good uh, student I have currently is writing about prodrugs for her term project. The idea behind this process is that only the enzymes that are expressed in cancer cells will be able to metabolize the prodrug into a derivative form that will be toxic to cancer cells and prospective patients. So again, we have sort of a long windup. If you ever see this in a piece of writing, you can almost always delete it. This sentence could start only the enzymes that are expressed in cancer cells, right? We don't need the idea behind this process. And now we have some passive voice. What is doing the expressing? Uh, and then we have some being verbs, right? Uh, passive voice hides the actor from the reader's mind and cognitively the reader is trying to catch up to some of that. It also has a red flag of repeating some words, which we can usually avoid. And finally, something arguably obvious in prospective patients. So we could rewrite this, for example. Oops. Here only enzymes inhabiting cancer cells can activate the prodrugs toxic form. Now I wanna end with talking uh, about numbers. And I'm following some fascinating work um, by Stanislaw Duhan, uh, leading cognitive science researcher working for some years and writing a fascinating book called The Number Sense. Um, this emerging cognitive science work is showing that the numbers between one and four are processed in a different part of our brain than all these higher, uh, larger, numbers that we use so commonly in science and uh, arguably will have a different impact. We can index things. In this audience, we're comfortable talking about uh, 19,347, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth. We have these indexed in our brain. Arguably, even among us, it will have a different impact than one to four of something. Our brains also work on logarithmic scales. This is one reason Anytime you have like uh, calibration of wrenches, monetary systems around, you'll have a 
10, 20, $50 bill, not a 70, 75, $80 bill, et cetera. So in that sense, thinking of proportions, thinking of percentages, super effective. I just went through an example with my class of how much mass it would take to move the earth to a different orbit when the sun turns into a red giant in a billion years or so, right? Uh, we could give some ridiculous number of kilograms, but the authors in that science writing piece said it would take over 60% of the earth's mass to accomplish that. That fact, very uh, effective. I like to say, bring it home. Um, tell my students, if you can bring a number by analogy into the household, into a kitchen, into a living room, it's very effective. Um, uh, those of us studying atomic structure, right? Teaching students about a nucleus, it's always a struggle. Uh, 10 to the fifth, five orders of magnitude between the size of a nucleus inside an atom and the outside's tough to communicate. Well, if the atom was an average two-story house, uh, that would mean by comparison, the nucleus would be a single poppy seed that fell off a muffin sitting down uh, on the floor of the second floor, for example. Or my wife walked by this talk and said, well, if it's a cell, the nucleus of a biological cell would be more like a bathroom in that house. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, and let's give a, a one more number. Um, we'll end up with a reference to um, Arlene's talk, which started us off, uh, started you off last week on Wednesday. Uh, with the wildfires recently, we had sort of these enormous numbers, a great example. One million acres, uh, let's say one million acres have burned in California. Now, I grew up in a relatively rural location. Um, I knew what an acre was, uh, but even if I walked on a piece of property, 100 acres, it, it brain kind of struggles with that size. Um, how can we talk about a million acres and what that means to California? Well, let's bring in a couch, reference all the way back to uh, Arlene's talk and, and some discussions of flame retardants. If California was a couch, you can run the numbers. One of those three couch cushions on the bottom would be forested. And if we do the math, 1 million acres would be about 20 square inches on that couch. So what burned in California was something about um, the size of a, of a tea saucer, right? That's not to trivialize it or make it alarming, but it just brought it into um, the living room for, for your audience. All right. Thank you.